Joe Biden kicks off his general election challenge to President Trump, ending the first ever virtual political convention. Plus two hurricanes at the same time hitting the U.S. It's looking like it could happen. And a special edition of Love, Hate, Eight, all about outdoor dining. Here's what you need to know. Good morning. This is Cheddar's Need to Know podcast for Friday, August 21st. I am Jill Wagner with Carlo Versano. Hey, Carlo. Happy Friday. Happy Friday, Wags. How are we doing over there? We're okay. It's lo- a long week, I think, with the convention this week. So oh, uh, happy week. it's Friday. Next, I think next week is going to be even crazier just in terms of the news, as we'll see in a minute. Um, all right, let's get to the news. On the fourth and final night of the virtual Democratic National Convention, Joe Biden formally accepted the Democratic presidential nomination, uh, telling Americans in an emphatic speech that the country will, quote, overcome this season of darkness. He pledged to work hard for those who didn't support him. The night featured prominent Democrats of a younger generation, like Pete Buttigieg and Senator Tammy Duckworth, um, who drew contrasts between Biden and President Trump. Biden's speech is largely being described as his career best. Even critics say that he blew away expectations. I saw Chris Wallace on Fox News last night say just that. Um, and uh, remember, you know, the, the Trump campaign's entire strategy vis-a-vis Biden is sort of painting him as this, you know, as cognitive cognitively impaired, right? Mentally not all there. Um, and, you know, I think it's he's clearly not as sharp as he was, you know, eight years ago or, or four years ago. But, you know, the problem with describing him as this like doddering old coot is that when he shows up and he does a, a good <laughs> job and has a fine performance, it kind of, you know, blows a hole in that whole strategy. And that was always the risk here because, uh, you know, he's, he's a, he's a politician. Like he's, you know, he's a fine speaker. Um, you know, anybody who's ever played sports in high school, even if they weren't very athletic, sort of like knows that, right? It's like the bigotry of uh, of low expectations, whatever that saying is. I always say the, the key to life is having low expectations. And oh, then you're just absolutely. always going to be happy. Absolutely. Um, I'm glad you mentioned Chris Wallace. Um, also, uh, Brett Baer, who's on Fox, said that this was Biden's best speech so far as far as delivery. Um, you know, all in all, I think this convention was a, a pretty big success. Um, if I felt like if there was one overarching message about Joe Biden, it was just that he's a nice person, that he cares, yep. he's compassionate. I thought that the little boy um, who stutters, I don't know if you saw that last night, in yeah, his account amazing. of meeting Joe Biden and just how inspirational it has been for him, I thought that was just so emotional um, and really effective, um, just showing you know Biden's empathy because, of course, he also uh, has had to overcome stuttering. Uh, there were a lot of questions about what a virtual convention would look like. I think I think that there are actually a lot of elements, as we've been talking about this week, like that virtual roll call that were better than years past and, and will probably yeah. be integrated into future conventions. I mean, what a difference, though, this all makes come Election Day is still not seen, obviously. Um, The question is, did anyone watch this convention and say, you know what, I am going to vote for Joe Biden now? Uh, Did it change minds or was it just preaching to the choir? You know, we live in this time where Americans can get snippets of what's going on through a media outlet that aligns with their view. Um, Mm -hmm. I was watching Tucker Carlson last night on Fox. um, And so he was showing clips of Obama's speech uh, from the night before. And then Clips of the news anchors from CNN and MSNBC and analysts who were who were, he described as fawning over it, um, and and Tucker Carlson was basically mocking the whole thing. Um, so you know the question is, does this change minds? You know, and what does it do on election day? And obviously we won't know that until until November. Uh, Republicans have their chance to make their case next week. President Trump will reportedly be featured every night in some capacity. So we'll see what it looks like. I mean, that sort of makes sense, right? Because he's it, the the convention when it's an incumbent is is always weird because it's like the guys already you already sort of know him. Um, it, it's it's you know it's it's less about introducing him. Um, but uh, I, I agree with you. I think from a production standpoint, it was way better than than I expected. The DNC that is. I think that they could have been a logistical and technical disaster, and it wasn't at all. Um, I think the Democrats did a very effective job of explaining the stakes. And you know, one notable thing: this was not a feel good convention. You know, a lot. A lot of times these things are like, 
uh, you know, appealing to our better angels and all this like lovey-dovey stuff. This w- this wasn't that. This was about fear, and that was a strategic choice. I think President Obama did did that most effectively. I think the party wants and they need a really big turnout in November, and the way that they think that they're going to be able to get that is to tell people that the entire democracy is essentially hanging in the balance um, of this election. Uh, and uh, to the point that you made, also, Jill, you know, putting aside policy. Uh, Biden is a man who just viscerally knows grief and trauma from his own life. And this country is going through both grief and trauma right now. And I think that that's sort of the underlying democratic message of the entire election. Um, And I believe that it was effectively delivered. Uh, President Trump, meanwhile, had a a bad day in court yesterday. So Steve Bannon, who is his former campaign manager, he pleaded not guilty after he was indicted on charges of fraud, along with three alleged co-conspirators. So federal prosecutors in New York took Bannon into custody while he was on a 150 foot yacht that was owned by a Chinese billionaire with the help of postal inspectors that were part of this investigation. I mean, talk about a headline that like you never thought you would be saying um, <laughs> last year. It's like, it's like okay. Trump era Mad Libs, right? It, it, seriously, uh, he is being charged, Bannon is being charged with defrauding donors who had given money to this private fundraiser for a border wall. The Fed say that he used a million dollars of that money for his uh, personal expenses. So basically there was this private organization that was raising money to build a border wall. And they actually did build a very small part of the wall, um, but they had promised that they weren't gonna, that all of the money that was raised was gonna go to building the wall and and yeah. prosecutors arguing it did not. It went, some of it went to Bannon. You know, it's always the people you least expect, Jill. Uh, Joe, uh, Joe Bannon, Steve Bannon is the sixth close Trump associate who has been indicted by the Department of Justice since Trump took office. He's the third Trump campaign manager to be arrested. So just imagine for a second if you knew somebody, like let's say a neighbor or a boss, for whom six of their direct underlings were criminally charged for different things in the span of like three years. You'd probably think there was something unsavory about that person, Uh, or at the very least that that person hung out with maybe the wrong crew. I, I, the thing about this is, I, first of all, I don't think anybody was surprised that Steve Bannon was was going to be indicted on something at some point. But the, the thing about this is, it's not like Watergate, right, where all of the you know all of Nixon's people got pinched for the same you know dumb thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, conspiracy, fraud, lying to the feds, accepting foreign interference. The the variety of the alleged criminality involved in in Steve Bannon, Manafort, uh, Gates. Uh, I can't even remember some of the other guys, but it's it's just a, it's amazing just in terms of its variety. Yeah, I mean, it, that makes a lot of people think twice. But I mean, I think for his supporters, for, for the president's supporters, I think it's just, you know, witch hunt. Uh, you know, I think you, you just sure, put it into right. kind of that basket. Um, you know, and, and the interesting part is that I was I was listening to one analysis of it is that. For Bannon, it's at look, it's actually not illegal if you want to raise money for something and you take some of that money, just say for overhead and, and costs or whatever, that, that's at, elite, that's legal, right? Charities do that all the time. Um, but the problem here is that they were saying that they weren't like they specifically Bannon and um this other person that he was working with specifically went out of their way to say not one penny of the money that you donate will go to anything except building the wall. So that was really where the criminality came in. Um, In an entirely different case, a federal judge has denied President Trump's effort to block the New York City District Attorney's Office from getting his tax returns um, after the Supreme Court cleared the way. So yes, four years later, we are still talking about the president's taxes. I uh, know. So his uh, Trump's lawyers immediately filed an appeal. Uh, the the thing you have to know about this is just that you know we are not going to see them before the election. Uh, this w- this will continue to to drag on. So just don't don't expect to see the president's tax returns this election cycle. Um, I also want to mention the Postmaster General will be testifying to the Senate today. He is expected to defend the cost-cutting measures at the post office against what he says is a quote false narrative that they are trying to degrade mail-in voting. Um, meanwhile, coronavirus deaths, so just switching gears here uh, onto the topic of coronavirus, 
uh, deaths in this country should start dropping, uh, particularly in the South by next week. That is according to the director of the CDC, who urged Americans to keep up mitigation efforts, uh, even if numbers do start going in a positive direction. Yeah, uh, hopefully, you know, hopefully we can this this current surge, we can really start to beat back now and the numbers are going in a positive direction, at least the uh, the new case numbers. I do want to quickly mention, um, in a, you know, we talked yesterday about the FDA uh, sort of pumping the brakes on its uh, emergency authorization for convalescent blood plasma. We got a great story from a listener yesterday. Um, he, he, he told us about his wife who was uh, deathly ill with the coronavirus, like really struggling. Uh, she had to be intubated. She was in the ICU and she got a plasma transfusion like the ones we were uh, that are that are being um, analyzed by the FDA. He said that she recovered. She believes that it was absolutely the plasma. Um, you know, it was just a, it was a really great story just about hope. Um, it was hopeful and it made me, you know, it made me really happy to hear. So I just wanted to mention um, and it just it's also like just because the FDA is saying like we're not going to, you know, give this emergency youth use authorization right now, it doesn't mean that 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 this this treatment is is dead or bunk. Right. It just means they're looking for more data. And if you you know, obviously it's anecdotal, but this is a story that it appears to show that it is working, at least in some cases. Right. I mean, because we're watching all this stuff in real time. It's like the expression, like, you know, how the sausage gets made. We're watching, yeah. um, you know, these trials and, and stuff. Normally, it's just that's regular people like us don't aren't really privy to that. So it's like this right. type of stuff happens all the time. Uh, this is just such a pressing thing. I'm glad you mentioned that email. Um, I saw I read it as well. And, you know, when it started, I was like, please end well, oh, just know. like, please. I was like, well, I'm hoping for a happy ending. So I was so happy uh, that it did end really well. Um, so I'm glad you mentioned it. Dr. Fauci, by the way, recovering following a successful surgery to remove a vocal cord polyp, uh, probably because of all the TV interviews that this guy's been doing. Uh, get some rest, Dr. Fauci, because we need you. We do. We bet. We, we, so I have a funny. Do we have time for a funny Dr. Fauci story from this week? I think um, always, a, always time for a funny Dr. Fauci it's a, story. It's not that funny, but it, but but I, I thought it was good. So my wife Becky, right? She works at Bloomberg, um, and she was producing an interview. You know, obviously we're working from home together, right? So, um, so I'm privy to like all of her work stuff, and she's privy to all my work stuff. Um, so, so she was producing a, a live interview with Dr. Fauci this week. Um, and it was just funny because like, I'm sitting here on the couch, you know, minding my own business. And then all of a sudden I just like hear his voice on her computer, right? She's like talking to him. And, um, so, I mean, I was like starstruck. It was like, it, you know, it'd be like if, you know, Scarlett Johansson was in the room with me or something. I was like, oh my God, Dr. Fauci, is that you? Um, but anyway, he said that, uh, he was, he said that he does as many as 19, I think that was his record, 19 media interviews a day. Um, wow. and I got it and the guy was so professional and he was, um, you, you know, he was just on, he was on his game. He was, he was just, uh, it was just really cool to sort of like look over her shoulder and watch that. So yes, get, get well soon, doc. Um, great story. I feel like there's, I hate to, I hate to call you guys out, but I feel like there's probably some sort of like journalistic ethics thing going on, um, issue going on in the Versano household, um, because yeah, of just yeah. like the, in, for, in turn, but, um, for another day. I mean, these are yeah. the situations that we're in uh, in 2020. Okay, overseas, the most uh, famous opposition leader in Russia fighting for his life right now in a Siberian hospital after someone is suspected of poisoning his tea. Uh, Alexei Navalny, who has been described as, quote, the man who Putin fears most, is currently in a coma in grave condition. He got sick while on board a flight to Moscow, uh, which then had to make an emergency landing so that he could be intubated. The Kremlin has wished him a speedy recovery. Ugh, trolls. Um, and Russian doctors, the, the latest development in this, which happened uh, 24 hours ago now when, when this, this news broke, Russian doctors now will not allow Navalny to be transferred to Germany, which has offered their, their, their medical help. Um, so it's... It's not looking good. Um, and again, like you said, this guy, this guy's a big deal. He's a, uh, you know, he is a major foe of Putin. And, uh, you know, I don't think it takes a brain surgeon to figure out what's probably happening here. A few years ago, um, CBS News interviewed him and he gave his chance of Putin trying to kill him. He said it was 50 50. So this wasn't yeah. something like surprising, you know, for us right. it is because 
as grim as our politics gets, it usually doesn't get there. You know, like we usually right. we're still we're still not at that <laughs> point yet. Um, but it could be coming um, soon. But he knew. But but um, uh, Navalny kind of knew, unfortunately, that this was a possible uh, a possibility. Okay, uh, let's just, talk about. No, I just want to say it's it's very a classic Putin thing to do something like that, allegedly do something like this, while the world's sort of paying attention to something else. Like remember. They annexed Crimea, Crimea like the day after the Sochi Olympics. Uh, so, you know, everyone's paying attention to politics in the U.S., the coronavirus everywhere else. So, you know, maybe then was the time to poison your enemies. Um, it's just it's very right out of their playbook. Um, meanwhile, here in the U.S., some of the wildfires burning in northern California have merged together to create a massive fire. It is being called the L, uh, excuse me, the LNU Lightning Complex. Those fires have grown to 215,000 acres with zero percent percent containment. I'm sorry, I don't know why I can't talk right now. Uh, four people have been killed uh, in those fires. Also, more activity in this insanely busy hurricane season. Texas and Louisiana are now in the cone of a tropical depression. It is headed toward the Gulf of Mexico, where it will almost certainly strengthen. And then a separate disturbance to the east now has Florida uh, in its cone. So that means uh, if you look at the latest models from the National Hurricane Center, there is a chance and an increasingly good chance that the United States mainland will see two tropical landfalls at once next week, probably around next Tuesday morning. Obviously, it's a little too early to, to know more than that. Uh, but, you know, of course, this would also be right smack in the middle of the RNC. Uh, so obviously, if you're down there, you know, be paying attention to this over the weekend. You know, when these storms get into the Gulf of Mexico, the, the water's warmer, so they get stronger and then they start moving faster. So uh, I, I suspect that we're going to have a very busy week of news next week. So get some rest this weekend. Um, yeah, I mean, and it's and again, like I, I know we've spoken about this before, but um, I think it bears repeating just dealing with these types of disasters in the middle of a pandemic um, is just a nightmare. And I kind of went through it in like in the, the most mildest form, just without power, sure. you know, with for uh, about a week last, you know, a couple of weeks ago. And and you just have to imagine, you know, we, we talked about it yesterday in California, where people are being told to be ready to evacuate, to leave their cars, you know, forward facing in their right. driveway, bags packed. But the question is, where do you go? Right. We're all sort of at home all the time. So if you're in the middle of a yeah. pandemic and you do have to evacuate, where where is safe for you? Um, you know, the, the safest place to, to shelter from a pandemic is home, uh, as right. we've all and been I, told. And you have to leave your house. Yeah. And where, you, I, no, for real, like, where do you go? I mean, do you, I, I'm not, do you go to a hotel? Do you go to family? I, you're not, you know, I don't, I mean, it just, it, it puts everyone in this position where it's like, what, what do you even do? Um, yeah. I mean, look, California's, I California's are some, re, they are some resilient mofos so i think that you know they are they know how fire season works and they know what to do but i do agree with you that like you know the, the human you know you can only take so much right <laughs> like at some point you just can't you can't there's it's just too much right it's it's feels right, like, no but it's it, it sorry go on no 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 that's that's it i mean it's not really like brilliant analysis but like you're i, I don't know what you do hurricanes fires heat waves pandemics because we've thought about it. I mean, my parents were, were my um, aunt and uncle have uh, they had power back uh, much earlier. And my parents were like, they were like, we if it, this goes on for my parents didn't have power and they did. And my parents were like, if this goes on for one more day, we're just going to go there because we can't take it anymore. You know, especially yeah. it was it was like 90 degrees or something. Now, they haven't really seen because of COVID, they have, they would never have gone into their house, right? Like that wouldn't have even been in the realm of possibility. Maybe they would get together right. in the backyard, which they haven't even do, done. Um, so it's just one of those things. It's like one thing on top of another. Um, and it yep. just adds a whole layer of complexity to responding to these natural disasters. Um, yeah, but absolutely. let's, it is Friday. So let's turn this thing around and end <laughs> it on somewhat of a happier note. Uh, let's do a little love, hate, eight. Carlo, start us out okay. uh, with so, love. So one thing we love outdoor dining, like you said, we're going to do a special outdoor dining edition. Um, I think we talked about this this week or last week. You know, New York City right now, it looks like Rome minus the tourists. Everyone is out on the streets. Um, 
you know, being as socially distant as, as they can. And, and these restaurants are, you know, I think doing really well. I actually, uh, a, a friend of my, or a neighbor of my parents is a, uh, owner of a restaurant in New York city, a fairly well-known restaurant. And he says he's actually doing better than he was before because the wow. outdoor dining has actually doubled his seating capacity. So that's not going to last for a long time, but you know, that's, that was fantastic news to hear that. So, you know, my big hope for the fall is, you know, that we start doing what the Europeans do so well, which is eat outside, even when it's cold, um, you know, get some space heaters out there, put a little like tarp up for the wind, put on your coat, drink your cappuccino and your, you know, in your hat and mittens. Um, it's great. It's one of the best, my favorite things to do in when I, whenever I'm in Europe and, uh, maybe it'll be one of the good things that comes from, from all of this this year in the U S yeah, and I, I think that it's been so successful in New York anyway that they're thinking about just making it a permanent thing, at least over the summer. Um, mm -hmm. I've seen the pictures. I haven't actually been back to, to Manhattan, um, at least you know on the Upper East Side and, and some of the areas where, where this is happening. And it, it looks like Europe. I mean, I remember seeing a couple of pictures on social media and thinking that's the Upper East Side, you know, yeah. and I... Um, so I, I'm just so pulling for so many of these restaurants and these bars. And to that end, one thing that we hate is that so many of these neighborhood bars and restaurants are struggling right now. Um, and it feels like nobody in power is fighting for them. Uh, so one, I'll spin this around and say one cool thing is that we can feel good about ourselves by eating out, right? Yeah. <laughs> and feeling no, like they're depending on us and spending our money uh, at some of these local local restaurants. Yeah, to, uh, I'm with you. I'm going to go out. My wife and I are going to go out to, to dinner this week. And I hope uh, if you're listening and you have the ability to do that, you should too, because to, like, to your point, Jill, they really are depending on us. And finally, one thing we ate, this is a true story, the saddest looking peanut butter and jelly sandwich I have ever seen made lovingly by this uh, the bartender at the local bar on my street, um, because they have to comply with this insane rule that you can't serve booze without food. So the bars in New York now are just like, they have the, the bartenders just making these little PB&Js to hand you with with your like gin and tonic. It's just, it's just, it's sad, but it's also funny. And it's like, you know, people will do what they got to do to survive. Right. Hashtag 2020. <laughs> it actually um, wasn't right, even that bad as far as a peanut butter and jelly sandwich goes. So I feel like there's going to be some really creative solutions to that, to your point of this, like the, the saddest PB and J ever made. <laughs> I, I think we, we might get some very clever bar snacks out of this. Oh, totally. um, all right, guys, we're going to leave it there. That's what you need to know for Friday, August 21st. Have a good weekend, everyone. <laughs>